is case number 114636 in the matter of Kenton Hall. Mr. Chief Justice, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal, please. Three minutes is granted. May it please the court, Deborah Hughes, Deputy Disciplinary Administrator, appearing on behalf of the Disciplinary Administrator's Office. This is an original action in attorney discipline. It's before the court after a hearing before a hearing panel on our formal complaint alleging violations of several rules under the Kansas Rules of Professional Conduct, specifically Rules 3.3, 8.4C, 8.4D, and Supreme Court Rules 208 and 218, and in addition, uh, KRPC 5.5. There was a hearing um, before the hearing panel where the respondents stipulated to all of the facts and all of the rules violations except for the uh, KRPC 5.5 and authorized practice of law allegation. The hearing panel uh, heard evidence, took the stipulations, and found the respondent violated all of the rules alleged except for 5.5 and Rule 218, which although there was a stipulation to that, the hearing panel found that because that was tied to the unauthorized practice of law allegation, um, dismissed our 5.5 out claim and dismissed the uh, Supreme Court Rule 218 uh, alleged violation. We, our office, took an appeal, filed a notice of appeal from the dismissal of those uh, rule violations, and in addition, we filed exceptions to two of the hearing panel's um, findings and application of the ABA standards on attorney discipline with respect to the issue of sanction. So the basic facts in this case uh, are essentially not disputed. Um, they center on or arise out of the respondent's representation of two criminal defendants in Johnson County uh, District Court on two separate cases while his license was suspended to practice law in the state of Kansas. He's licensed in Missouri. His license in Kansas was suspended in 1996 after he failed to pay the attorney registration and submit his annual registration. It has remained suspended from that point forward and is suspended to this day. Um, at the same time, uh, respondent was admitted in 1988, and then he was admitted about six months later in Missouri in 1989. He allowed his license in Kansas, um, well, let me back up. First, he changed his Kansas license status to inactive because he took a position with the Missouri public defender system. And uh, then in August of 1996 uh, is when he discontinued paying his annual attorney registration. And at that point in November of 1996, this court issued an order suspending his license to practice law. In 2003 and in 2009, um, Mr. Hall made two inquiries to the appellate court clerk's office asking about how he could get his Kansas license reinstated. Both times he was uh, sent paperwork that notified him that his license was reinstated and here are the steps you need to take in order to be reinstated, or that his license was suspended and that these are the various steps you need to take in order to be reinstated and Mr. Hall did not take any steps to have his license reinstated after that. In 2012, Mr. Hall applied for Pro Hoc Vice admission in Johnson County District Court to represent a criminal defendant. Um, in the application that was submitted in accordance with Supreme Court Rule 116, um, the format for that application required Mr. Hall to list the bars um, to which he was admitted, the dates of admission, and his attorney registration number. He did not list his Kansas bar admission. He was also required to state whether he was in good standing with each state bar, and um, he said yes, although his Kansas license was suspended, but he hadn't even disclosed it. And he also affirmed um, 
that he was in good standing when his license was suspended. So those are the, the two main things in that Pro Hoc Vice admission. The court granted his Pro Hoc Vice admission and he had local counsel in those cases, that case. And he represented the criminal defendant. It went to jury trial and he received, I believe, a favorable outcome. In 2013, the same thing happened. He submitted another Pro Hoc Vice application to the district court and again answered the questions the same way, failed to disclose the existence of his Kansas bar license and um, affirmed that his license, that he was in good standing in other state bars. He was admitted Pro Hoc Vice and then at, in the course of that case, um, his local counsel submitted a complaint to our office after she discovered that his license was what she thought was inactive at that point. We took an appeal um, from the district court's decision dismissing our 5.5 allegation and Rule 218 allegation on unauthorized practice of law. The district or the uh, final hearing report, the panel's uh, hearing report, gives no rationale for the dismissal of that claim. Um, so in the, our brief, we, we had to take a stab at what their rationale might be, but it, it's our argument here that the, the, well, the issue before the court is essentially one of law. It's a pure question of law. Under these facts, which are stipulated to, does an attorney whom this court has suspended from the practice of law engage in the unauthorized practice of law, as that's defined under Supreme, or KRPC 5.5, when he represents litigants in the Kansas courts? Here, the clear and convincing evidence showed that the respondent knew that he was suspended by an order of this court. He either knew it um, when he received the November 1996 order, and he certainly knew it when he called twice in 2003 and again in 2009 and was informed of that status. If you are suspended by an order of this court, you are not authorized to practice law in this state. You're not so, authorized to practice as a member of the state bar. Right. You. Does that necessarily mean, however, that you're unauthorized as the recipient of an order upon a pro hoc application? Well, if you look at the language of Rule 5.5 and the various other rules, but we'll start with 5.5. A lawyer shall not practice law in a jurisdiction in violation of the regulation of the legal profession in that jurisdiction. What higher authority is there than an order of this court suspending somebody from the practice of law? What, um, that's the uh, regulation of the legal profession in this jurisdiction by the sole authority that has the power to do that and has suspended that attorney from the practice of law. If so, someone had disclosed, mm -hmm. if he had disclosed that he was a suspended Kansas lawyer on his Pro Hoc Vici application, and then nevertheless the Pro Hoc Vici was granted, would that mean then that the order of suspension had been superseded? If there hadn't been a uh, failure to disclose? I think not. Um, and the reason I say that is because of the language of rule. I think that it's in 218 or 208. I think it's in Supreme Court Rule 208. And I will get you that language here. 208, which is the rule on attorney registration, and that's the rule that he violated when he failed to pay his annual attorney fees and registration. 208E says that it's the duty of each member of the judiciary of the state to prohibit an attorney who's been suspended from the practice of law from appearing or practicing in any court. And so the judge, the district court judge, even if he was submitted a pro hoc vice application that fully disclosed the status of his Kansas license when it was suspended, has no authority. Supreme Court Rule 208E clearly tells the district court judge, it's your duty to prohibit it. You cannot allow it. And further, the rule goes on to state that it's the duty of each member of the bar and judiciary to report that, any attempt to do that, to the disciplinary administrator's office. So it be your position then that the failure to disclose that information on the pro hoc application renders the order essentially void. It is. That, that is my argument under Rule 208E, and to have practiced under that void order is in violation of the regulation of the legal profession of the state.
moving to the second issue, unless there are any further questions on issue one, um, I would ask that the uh, court uh, find a violation of KRPC 5.5 and Supreme Court Rule 218. And uh, just to tie that up quickly, <laughs> Rule 218 um, is the one that says that the uh, it is the unauthorized practice of law and a 5.5 violation for a suspended attorney to practice law. I would also note that in the hearing panel's final hearing report, they did find a violation of Supreme Court Rule 208, which also contains the same language, that it's a 5.5 violation to practice law in violation of a suspension order. Um, yet they did not find a violation of the 5.5 and 218, so it's, it's a little internally inconsistent in that regard. Issue two uh, concerns the exceptions, um, that we took exception to two of the hearing panel's findings and the application of those findings in its, deci in its decision on sanction. Um, at the hearing before the hearing panel, it was our office's recommendation that the respondent be suspended for a period of 60 days. The respondent argued for published censure in the hearing panel. Uh, recommends published censure. It's our position here today that a 60 day suspension is the appropriate sanction. We take specific exception with two things that are in the final hearing report with regard to sanctions. And the first is the panel's finding that the respondent's state of mind was negligent. The state of mind required for the most serious violations in this case, um, the 3.3 and the 8.4C, which involved dishonesty and misrepresentation require a knowing state of mind. And the hearing panel found specifically a violation of 3.3A1, which requires knowing misrepresentation or false statement to the court in the submission of the pro hoc vice application. So to find that the controlling state of mind for purposes of sanction is negligence ignores their very own findings on the rule violations. And so, to the extent that some clarification might be needed for hearing panels in the future, uh, it's our argument that the, uh, the highest level of rule violation or the most serious rule violation, the state of mind that is involved in that the, is the uh, controlling state of mind, the most culpable state of mind. The second uh, issue that we have with the hearing panel's findings is the uh, application of the 200, 2012 amendment to Supreme Court Rule 217. Uh, basically, the panel found that that amendment, which allowed, which allows the voluntary surrender of a license as opposed to as an alternative to going inactive or uh, disabled or retired, um, had that been available to the respondent, he might have um, chosen to do that rather than to allow his license to be suspended, I think is the, is the theory. The problem is no one argued that um, we had no opportunity to question the respondent about that. Um, there are many questions I would have had for him about whether he would have been more interested in surrendering his license as opposed to just being suspended um, that I would have been interested in the answers to, so I could have made an argument before the hearing panel on that, but the first we heard of it was in the final hearing report. So it's our position today that the 60-day suspension is the appropriate sanction. Um, unless the court has any other questions in closing, I just request that the court find the respondent violated 5.5 and 218C1, adopt the rest of the panel's findings and conclusions, and impose a 60-day suspension. Effective as of what date? The date the opinion is issued. And I realize that the, since he's already suspended, it, it would have technically no practical effect, but it would um, arguably prevent him from seeking reinstatement for 60 days. Do we have any questions? Thank you, Council. <clears throat> May it please the court, Mr. Chief Justice, Your Honors, John Ambrosio on behalf of the respondent. Let me start off by telling you the respondent and I agree with the panel as far as the factual synopsis that they laid out in the hearing report. We agree that the rules violations were stated by the hearing panel, and we agree that the perfect punishment and the just punishment in this case would be published censure. And this is regardless of how you come down as far as the exceptions and the brief filed by the parties. And I think the reason for that is as follows. When you look at the report and you look at the mitigating factors, 
A, there was no record. B, he's rectified his conduct in that he gave back a fee in one of the cases where he had accepted a fee to represent somebody under a pro hoc in Wyandotte County. He cooperated with the investigators. He cooperated during the hearing. He stipulated the facts. He enjoys an excellent and good reputation. That's in D. And E, he is so remorseful. One of the most important pieces of evidence in this case was Respondent's Exhibit F, which was received by the respondent prior to him filing under pro hoc in both cases. Exhibit F is a letter from the clerk's office that says, not suspended, doesn't say anything other than inactive. He should have known, he made a mistake, he thought he was inactive. Now, when he talked to me about it, I couldn't figure out, we couldn't figure out why a good, bright criminal defense lawyer would have filed and put in his pro act application, leave out the suspension. Had him search through his office and he found the file that indicated that he was inactive, not suspended. He relied on that and he proceeded. What was the date on that letter? It was in two, was two, it 2000, 2009. It was 2009, as I remember, and it was prior to the pro hoc, pro hoc applications, I believe, in both cases. And I interrupted you, Mr. Chief Judge. No, I, I, I'm trying to answer. Certainly. What, what was the basis then on August 1st, 2013, for Ms. Sanders to file a complaint based upon her belief that his license to practice law was inactive? I don't know what yeah, the basis was, but I think she had an obligation to do it. Mr. Ambrosio, there, oh, I'm sorry. Was, no, I'm sorry, Chief. I, go ahead. Did, did she have some information that suggested it was merely inactive versus suspended? Or I don't know. That never came out. She did not testify at the hearing. I don't know that, Your Honor. All right, thank you. I, I, I've got a letter here dated May 13th, 2003, and one dated May 26th, 2009. The opening sentence of that, on November 5th, 1996, your license was suspended for not paying an attorney registration fee. And the same sentence is included in the 2009 letter. What I, But isn't in F, if you look at F, I, it I'm says sorry. inactive on it. It's stamped right on there, inactive. I put that in evidence. I know that. I'm, just, I'm, just I'm, I'm not fighting I'm, with you. I would no, never no, no, no. I'm, so, I'm just looking at two letters that say that he's suspended. That's oh, no, I understand that. And I'm not saying he didn't have flawed judgment, Your Honor. Right. I'm saying that he did receive something that said he was inactive, and that would be F. Yeah, I mean, I've got Exhibit F in front of me, which is the same thing that Justice Rosen's talking about. And in the first paragraph, the opening paragraph of the letter, it uses the word suspension three times. I, I hear that, and I agree with you. It does say that. I'm not fighting with you, but you also see... So what's that saying? supposed to communicate? I mean, so... so and, and, and it has the word inactive, too. Okay, fine. Okay. But what's that supposed to communicate to a lawyer? He should have known. There's no doubt about that. He should have known. But I'm saying the word inactive misled him. We're not whining about it. We're not complaining about it. But I think it's important when you, you take this into consideration when you make your decision on this man's license. That's well, all I'm it saying. it says inactive at the time you were suspended, you were inactive. That's what it says. It's in the... the the letter itself says, at the time you were suspended, your license was on in the active Yes, it status. does. Yes, it does. But it says inactive right there in front of God and everybody. Okay. All right. I'm not going to come off that. I hear what you're all saying. It, but it, it does say inactive. Is that fact true, untrue, or we don't know? Is what fact true? The, the first sentence of Exhibit F. Or, I'm sorry, the second sentence. At the time you were suspended, your license was on inactive status. It's true. Okay, so the... The clerk didn't make a mistake. I did not, I'm not accusing the clerk. I, okay, I'm just trying clerk. to find clarity. But when you put something that says inactive and you send it to a lawyer, why put that in there? That's all I'm saying. And, that's, and he should have been smarter than that. And he should not have made it that a mistake. He should have known better. He's a bright lawyer. But I'm saying that colors the situation. Okay. That's all I'm saying. This is, a, this is a great lawyer. He has a terrific reputation in, in federal court in Kansas and in Missouri. He has a great reputation in Missouri. He is still, at 64, almost 65 years of age, 
He's still accepting major appointments in federal court. He is the emeritus CJA, you know, which they send people of his ilk, people of his brilliance, people of his ability to Wichita. They send them to, to, to Topeka to try these major cases. He has 50 or 60 major litigations, including homicide cases and everything else. He has never had a blemish on his record. He has done a great Mr. job. Mr. Mr. Ambrosio, excuse me. Did you just say he's going to Topeka and Wichita to try cases? In federal court, he can. All right. I was just confused for a minute about that. Now, there's no, the, the confusion he's is maybe that I misspoke. He has emeritus status, which means since he's on the federal CJA panel in Kansas. Are you saying emeritus? Emeritus. Thank you. I was just. He is on that status. He is on that status. Ergo, he is picked by the judges to go to Topeka and Wichita to do major cases. And very few CJA lawyers reach that status. This is a good lawyer. He represents his clients very well. And to take him out for 60 days, and I know you're going to tell me that's not our fault, would hurt 50 or 60 clients. And I think we have to look at that when we're handing out discipline cases. Without... If it's with your permission, my client would now. Wait, wait, what's his current status now? In? In Kansas. In Kansas, the state of Kansas, he is inactive, suspended status. So, I was just so, going to say, so, so administratively why is suspended. Correct. In federal court in Kansas, he's on the CGA panel, and they know about this, and he is licensed to practice, and in Missouri, the same. So is what we do here contingent on him continuing to practice in his CGA? J.A. status? Not right away, but you know what the federal court's going to do. If you say he's suspended, they're going to send out a letter that says, you either accept, do you accept the discipline uh, that was meted out in Kansas in federal court in Kansas? I thought he is suspended. Administratively. Administratively suspended, but not in federal court. But that court. doesn't matter to federal court, obviously. Appar apparently not. Okay. Just so I'm clear, well, let's assume, for argument's sake, that we do suspend him on his Kansas license for 60 days, effective okay. as the date of our opinion per okay. counsel's request. What impact, if any, does that have on his ability to continue practicing his profession in the federal courts? What will occur upon them receiving your judgment that he's suspended? They will send a letter. The clerk of the court in Kansas, federal court, will send him a letter that indicates, they do this all the time, do you accept the same punishment in federal court? And if he says yes, then he'll be suspended there. I have no idea what's going to happen in the state of Missouri or in federal court in Missouri, in the Western District of Missouri. I have no idea. And what happens when he gets his letter from the federal court clerk in Kansas and he says, no, I'm not accepting that as my federal punishment, if you will? Do you know what happens? I assume they give him a hearing, but I don't know. I really don't know. Because everybody usually accepts the punishment meted out by this court in federal court. It's smart, takes less time, and then he's back in practice in 60 days in federal court. That would be my logic, I think. All right, thank you. All right. Mr. Ambrosia, before your client addresses us, I'd like to hear your response to the disciplinary administrator's position with regard to whether or not the pro hoc order was void due to misstatements on the application or, or, or uh, not disclosing certain facts on the application. It's not void. They gave him the order. It was based on wrong fact pattern, but they gave him an order which gives him the license to practice law. In my brief, the only thing I could come up with was somebody gets a, a license to drive. If they're wrong, that doesn't mean that person doesn't have a license right. to drive. Well, that's that the was, question as to whether it's void. So I guess my follow-up question yes. is your position would be that had it been disclosed, the district court would have actually had the authority to grant that order. I believe so. Whereas the disciplinary administrator claims, no, that the district court would have not had the authority. I believe they could. Okay. Mr. Chief Justice, may he address the panel? Certainly. If you'd like to read it because it's fairly nervous. I appreciate it. <coughs> Thank you for this opportunity to address the court. I would like to sincerely apologize for my conduct in this matter, not only as an attorney sworn to defend my clients, 
but also as an officer of the court. I feel like I have betrayed the trust of the court and my fellow attorneys and have, by my actions, caused harm to our profession. Regardless of the outcome of these proceedings, I will have to live with the knowledge of that fact for the rest of my life. I have always striven to conduct my professional life with honor and dignity and honest hard work on behalf of my clients. That is why this particular incident will leave such a stain on my career that I am otherwise proud of. And for that, I can only blame myself. Although I made some bad decisions, I am not a bad person, and I did not act with a malicious or greedy intent. I ask the court to consider that fact along with all the facts that are present in this case. Thank you. Mr. Hall, at the time you um, submitted your Pro Hoc Vici application, in two, the first one was 2012, right? Um, the, did you believe your, the status of your Kansas license to be merely inactive, or did you believe it to be administratively suspended as well? And this is, I believed it to be inactive. Based on what? Based on uh, the uh, attachment to the most recent communication I had from the clerk of the Supreme Court in 2009. Is this Exhibit F that your counsel's made reference to? Yes. Okay. Even though it says it was suspended in 96 and you knew that you had not followed up on either the 2003 or the 2009 inquiries to the clerk's office? Yes. And that was very careless thinking on my part. I had not considered it carefully. And I, when the, uh, the client approached me about the representation, what I did was I went and pulled a file that I had maintained of my communications with the clerk's office mm -hmm. to see what the most recent letter said. And yes, it said you are suspended, but you are inactive is how I interpreted it. Okay. And the, the suspension part, I separated in my mind a disciplinary suspension from a administrative suspension that I could correct by taking certain steps. But you hadn't taken those steps. I had, I had not taken those steps, Your Honor, because I found that for my particular circumstance, it was almost impossible for me to take those steps okay. because I didn't have the records. You have to be a Kansas lawyer or a member of the Kansas bar? Uh, in, 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 practical, in a practical sense, I did not, Your Honor. I, I approached the, was trying to, but you still had your number, right? You yes. still had a ball. What bothers me the most here is candor to the tribunal, Correct. submitting the application and um, conveniently ignoring the fact that you did still have a Kansas number and still had a license, albeit suspended, but no one had taken that license away from you. Uh, what was your thinking in that regard? Uh, your Honor, uh, the honest answer is there was there was no thinking. I that was my mistake. And I guess that's where I'm. I got the same problem. Everybody else does, I guess. Um, question. One of the questions on this application that you signed, question six, says, "Have you been suspended in any jurisdiction?" And are you telling us that when you said no? that you defined suspension the way you wanted to and then signed the pleading and filed it with the court. At that time, Your Honor, I, again, I considered that I had not been suspended in a disciplinary sense and truthfully, I told my proposed local counsel that I wasn't active. I never, I honestly believed that even though it was a faulty belief. I was not trying to lie to them. Uh, I didn't tell them I'm inactive and also suspended uh, because to me it was like the two go together. If you're inactive, you can't practice. Uh, I, my, again, my thinking was very careless and reckless and uh, I think that's where I, I made my mistakes. 
I didn't intend to mislead the court uh, or to misrepresent the facts, and I certainly was careless though when I when I did do so. Is it? Oh, <clears throat> go ahead. Go ahead. Is it true that uh, that you were on inactive status prior to the administrative suspension? Yes, sir. And uh, just just for clarification for me, you, your status currently is you're suspended. Yes, sir. Kansas. And how does that Im How will a sixty day suspension, disciplinary suspension, impact your current? status in Kansas and your current practice as far as you know I, or we just you're just speculating I, I, well what, 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 what will happen your honor I believe that uh, my belief is that Missouri and Kansas have reciprocal discipline procedures and I'm afraid that if this court levies a specific 60-day suspension that I will could face the prospect of being suspended in the state of Missouri, my state bar license there for 60 days, as well as my membership in the Western District of Missouri Federal Court and the District of Kansas Federal Courts, which would involve the 10th and 8th circuits. So I'm afraid that the farther reaching consequences would uh, very detrimentally impact my clients and my practice, sir. So the fact that you have been administratively suspended in Kansas is of no concern to the federal courts. It's only if we suspend you as a matter of discipline that they become concerned. Is that your well, understanding? My, uh, Your Honor, uh, the annual, to reinstate annually your membership in the federal courts, the District of Kansas requires payment of a, of a minimal fee and you have to answer online certain questions. And I have disclosed for the past two years while this matter has been pending, that it is a pending matter, uh, an ethical discipline, investiga investigative pending disciplinary matter. I have disclosed that on my application, my annual renewal questionnaire. So that has been disclosed to the United States court that this matter is pending, although... For the last two years? Yes. Prior what about that, 96? Prior to that, I... Finish. No. On that electronic form, is there any uh, request for you to tell the federal court what your standing with the Kansas Bar is? Um, no, I don't believe there's a specific... So the federal form doesn't ask to uh, for you to explain what bars you're admitted to and what your standing is in those bars. No, Your Honor, I don't recall I, that. I, I did have a question. The uh, form that you signed and submitted to Johnson County District Court, and this is a finding of the panel here, paragraph four of the application required you to list all bars to which the applicant is admitted, the dates of admission, and the applicable attorney registration numbers unquote, and their conclusion was the respondent did not list his Kansas bar admission, and you've not taken exception to that. So my question is, why did you not? Why did I not list it? Yes. I, to honestly, Your Honor, I approached, and again, I, I, it's hard for me to, I can't really provide a rational explanation except that my thinking was very loose and careless during that period of time. But I approach that Pro Hoc Vice situation uh, from my perspective as if there was no Kansas license, that I was a visiting attorney and I wasn't trying to rely upon my Kansas status in any way. I was trying to come in as a visiting attorney with local counsel and paying the fee. And uh, I, that's the an honest answer, Your Honor. I, I just, uh, I wasn't trying to intentionally mislead. I was just trying to provide my memberships in bars in which I was a valid active member. And that was my intent. Uh, and, uh, but I think that was wrong and uh, I was wrong. So. Very well. Do we have any further presentation from either of you, counsel? No. I have more questions. 
Yeah, just one, Mr. Ambrosio. Uh, can you shed any light or provide any insight for us on why the hearing panel uh, found no unauthorized practice of law? Obviously, they made that finding. Disciplinary administrator made the comment earlier that we didn't know why they made that finding. I just thought you might have some I, insight. I'd love to answer your question. I'd like to say that maybe they thought of the same thing that I put in my brief. But, but, but honest to goodness, I don't have okay. I don't have an answer. But maybe somebody thought about the same thing I put in my brief. That's the only thing I can think of. Thank you. I'm sorry, any further questions? Thank you both. Thank you. Here's your three court, minutes. Thank you. Unless the court has any other questions, I'll waive further rebuttal. Any more questions? I see none. Thank you, Council. We thank all three of you for your arguments this afternoon. The court will take this matter under advisement. That can